So I was really tired and I skipped coffee and I always need coffee. And as I blew through the first light, it was yellow. The second one I looked up was red, but I didn't understand why a car was coming so fast. It was almost like they anticipated the light changing. And we both hit each other at about 60 miles an hour. Immediately I knew something was wrong with my body because I was slumped over to one side and I couldn't move. The closest thing I could say to a prayer was, God help me. Control is taken out of your hands in a moment like that. We spend so much of our time trying to control life, and in that moment I knew it was over. What happened next, it was out of my control. I grew up in the country in East Texas, and I had a very free, wonderful childhood in the sense that I spent a lot of time in nature. My best friend and I would ride horses. We'd get up at six in the morning. These were great times in the summer, and we would ride until it got too hot around noon. We'd swim in lakes. And so we lived this life that was very much grounded in, in nature, and that part of my life was fantastic. The painful part of childhood was my mom was mentally ill and there was a lot of emotional uh, abuse and some physical abuse. And so I was isolated as this only child. I kind of retreated into books and into studies and I saw college as my way out. You know, that was my success route. There weren't any other routes, <laughs> like that was it. So I wrote all these essays and I got $20,000 worth of scholarships, just, you know, one, one essay competition after another. This was a big deal. And our mailbox, we, I grew up very poor, was like falling over practically. The house was in shambles and I was like, God, is the mailbox even going to be dependable to get these checks? And, and so, you know, I'd wait by the mailbox, these checks started arriving. And then I knew that somehow my life was going to change. And there was a lot that depended on and weighed on going to college. It meant a lot to me. I went to the University of Texas and it's kind of a party school. So at first my grades were really great and then they started declining and my senior year, I was depressed. I'd been through a bad breakup. I knew that my drinking and drug use was kind of off the charts in some ways, you know, that it was really um, bad. I was like, I have to get my life together. And I was actually sort of having these panic attacks about mortality because I was agnostic at that time. I really did not think there was an afterlife. I studied English, so obviously I studied Walt Whitman and some spiritual writers, Emerson, Thoreau, and I thought about what they said, and that was the closest I could get to spirituality. I thought, well, maybe I'll just blend with the grass or maybe we continue on in some metaphysical way, but for the most part, I thought my identity, the Trisha, my consciousness would not continue. And I would have these moments where I would think, wow, we just die. And then I'm gonna not be here anymore. And this is all I have. And what am I doing with my life? And I'd really panic. And I went to see a therapist. Emotionally, I was still kind of dealing with some of the abuse in childhood. And this therapist suggested that I run because that was something I loved in high school. I ran cross country. And so running was my symbol of, you know, if I ran hard enough, if I ran fast enough, maybe I could outrun my demons and maybe I could be super healthy and super strong. So I was running nine, 10 miles a day, training for the Austin 10K. The night before I ran that race, I started having these nightmares, which I don't talk about too often because it seems like time is already out of sync, but I felt something coming for me. So I was really tired and I skipped coffee 
and I always need coffee. And as I blew through the first light, it was yellow. The second one I looked up was red, but I didn't understand why a car was coming so fast. It was almost like they anticipated the light changing and knew that it would change. And we both hit each other at about 60 miles an hour. Immediately I knew something was wrong with my body because I was slumped over to one side and I couldn't reach my driver's license and, and insurance forms and I couldn't move basically. And I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. Eventually a good Samaritan stopped and she was a nurse. She stayed with me, held my hand and she was beautiful. I, you know, I'll never forget the kindness of her. She helped me until the ambulance arrived and they put me on a board. The closest thing I could say to a prayer was, God help me. <laughs> you know, I, I, that moment, you know, control is taken out of your hands in a moment like that. And we spend so much of our time trying to control life. And in that moment, I knew it was over. Everything depended on the surgeons, what happened next. It was out of my control for the most part. All I had was my voice as the, the one thing that might be able to help me along this way. I never thought about having health insurance. I was a college student who just thought, I'll get a good job out of college. I'm young, I'm healthy that won't be a factor. So they took me to a downtown hospital. Because I had internal injuries, they did lots of CAT scans. They knew that my back was broken several places. I was in shock. I didn't, I'd never known anyone to recover from back surgery. I didn't know if I'd walk. I was trying to get specifics from nurses. I was trying to get pain meds too, because it was painful. They refused. So they said, until a neurosurgeon signs off on this and says, we're taking you in with the risk, we cannot give you painkillers. So I was strapped down to a board for 17 hours before I went into surgery. So family members were coming and going. Uh, I was really kind of a, a mess, you know, psychologically screaming at people at different times, crying. Then eventually the self-pity really took over. A nurse said that a neurosurgeon was coming in to talk to me and she, came in and I looked at her and I said, I'm gonna kill myself if I can't walk, so I need you to operate on me. And she said, okay, I will, but I've been on duty for 40 hours, so I have to go home and I have to take a nap and I must eat something and then I'm coming right back here and I'm operating on you. And there was such relief because someone had passed, I'd overheard the conversation, there was a neurosurgeon who didn't wanna come in because I didn't have health insurance. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm being thrown away. You know, I'm trying so hard and here I'm just nothing. I'm just, you know, a, a body on this stretcher. All of that was the physical world. So my brain was totally in that moment of the physical. I was worried about classes. I was worried about walking. Really wasn't worried about death. Even when they wheeled me in and it said 17% chance of death, I didn't even stop to ask. I thought, hmm, well, that's a kind of a high chance, but <laughs> uh, I'll go with it because I want to walk. And so they wheeled me in and, and Dr. Flan was the doctor's name and she squeezed my hand and that's the last thing I remember until I popped out of my body. The minute I popped out, I was kind of in the corner of the room looking down at the surgeons and looking down at my body. And when you're outside a body, you don't see with normal eyes. You kind of see with this 360 de degree vision and you can zoom in on something or you can see behind you, but it's not that important. You know, you're mainly looking at what you're looking at. But I remember the tops of the surgeon's heads and I remember their hands and I remember that there was a song on the radio. There was actually an Elvis song on the radio. It was the easy listening station. And so I was like, oh, I know this station. <laughs> and so there was, you know, a lot of awareness of the room itself and of the surgeons. And then I thought, oh, I'm alive. I, I, I live beyond this body. And I was so excited. I wanted to tell my agnostic friends in that moment. I was like, oh, I could explain this to them. They will understand. Consciousness definitely goes on. It, it was a much longer <laughs> time period that it, talk, it took to actually communicate with them. But I thought that that moment was profound enough, just looking at my body, looking at the surgeons. 
I was happy. I mean, there is no word that describes that happiness. It was relief and absolute peace that we go on. That I mean, I was convinced in that first moment because my consciousness felt at ease. Like I always feel a little bit nervous in the body and I think most people do probably to some degree. There's something, some pain somewhere or some anxiety or something is going on. In that space, nothing. There was no pain. There was just peace. And my intelligence seemed greater outside of the body. And I even thought about that because these neurosurgeons had to be brilliant. You know, Dr. Flan had her assistant and he was beside her. And I remember looking at them and then these light beings were behind them that were about nine feet tall. I call them light beings. I called them angels in my book, you know, angels in the OR because that that makes sense to more people, but all I knew was that they were intelligent, they could communicate telepathically, and they were there to send healing through the neurosurgeons and into my body. And they assured me I'd walk, that I would run again even, and that everything would be fine. And then they almost said playfully, watch this. And when they said, watch this, they just shot all this energy and light through the neurosurgeons and it lit up my entire spine. And I remember thinking, that's fantastic. I mean, the neurosurgeons have to know angels work through them. I'm gonna ask them about this later. This is, this is amazing. You know, they, they're so intelligent. They have to know that there's even a higher intelligence working with them. And you know, that moment stood out in my mind, but then the monitor flatlined. And in that moment, I thought, oh, I'm technically dead and I don't really wanna watch. Do they have to flip me over? What are they gonna do? How are they gonna revive me? Years later, I found that I had internal bleeding and I was bleeding to death and they started cauterizing veins and, and trying to stop the bleeding and giving me blood transfusions and that's what brought me back. But I left. I And when you're in spirit form, you can just move through walls. So I moved through the first wall and then a couple more walls and I was watching my stepdad get a candy bar out of the machine. And this was my verifiable detail. To me, it didn't mean anything other than I thought he was a health nut. So the candy bar was funny <laughs> to me. I was like, oh, he has a secret sugar addiction. I know it. <laughs> and so I chuckled and, and kind of moved into this space above Austin, which was the night sky. And I floated there for a while and I, the freedom felt great. I wasn't afraid, I just felt free and happy. Even though I was told I'd return to the body, I thought, well, I'm pretty far away now, maybe I'm not. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm gonna stay here. And if I stayed here, would this be okay? And it was, it was totally fine if I stayed there to me. Because outside of body, I felt as if I was supported by greater consciousness, like the brain, Dr. Evan Alexander and others say the brain is a limiter of consciousness, that it limits what we experience and what we see. And outside of body, we see more. And so I just knew in those first few moments that, oh, that this experience does not compare to <laughs> being in the body. One of my other initial thoughts was, oh, this is theater. So all that we're doing is we're acting and we're learning things and we're putting on these bodies, these costumes. It didn't feel real. Like that felt like the reality, kind of like Oz behind the curtain or it was like, oh, now I understand. We just come here. And a lot of people talk about reincarnation. That makes total sense to me now. At that time, I didn't really think about it. I just was looking at the specifics of that life and realizing, you know, this life <laughs> that we go on. I also felt the energy of everyone I'd ever known and wanted to tell everyone basically, I love you, be better, be happy, enjoy your life. I mean, that's, that's the message of the soul is not anything negative. It's just, hey, go love your life. And you know, the Hubble um, telescope images, there's a couple of them that I swear are very similar to what I saw. So the pink expanse of stars, light, just I was floating somewhere I didn't recognize, but I knew I was in the stars. I also felt this greater intelligence coming toward me in the form of light. And it, almost like the telepathy from the angel's eyes, it, it 
came towards me and told me different messages like love is all that matters it's all that you take with you when you leave this place be like a little child remind them to go to nature all of these seem like crystallized simple messages but there were about five or six messages like that and they just were implanted deep within me and i knew i would never forget them that that was just meant to be something i took back then I was shown a portion of my life, and I saw some of childhood where I played in nature, moments where I had faith, and these moments were good. Like, the light seemed to say, hey, your faith was beautiful, your love for animals was beautiful, just remember the good and the good parts of life. And the things that were not good melted away, almost like, you know how shadow just falls away? It was almost like, well, that's not what I'm taking with me. Almost as if that message, love is all that we take with us. We don't hold on to the negative in this place of light. I saw the life review, some places where I could be better. <laughs> and, and I was a little bit cliquish and judgmental. I, I was proud of myself for getting into UT and I kind of looked down on people who didn't go to college. So at different jobs where I worked, I looked at people who work full-time as wait staff, and I, I wasn't rude to them, but I didn't give them room to get to know me. And I saw how kind they were, and I saw that they went home, this one couple, and they prayed about me. And I, I, I almost want to cry when I think about it because they saw that I was this depressed person, and they cared. And I didn't even give them the time of day because I didn't like what they wore. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. So in that moment, I thought I can do better. I can be a better person. That I'm not leaving room for the beauty of who people are. That was the main focus of how I was gonna change as, as if Creator Source wanted me to look at the beauty in people and their, their heart. It's almost like our soul knows how to be, but we forget in our culture and we forget based on trying to feel special or trying to feel good about ourselves. As I finished that life review, I ended up in this place. It was full of greenery and beautiful grass. There was no death. Some people might call it heaven. To me, it looked like a consciousness that I was participating with that my grandfather appeared and he wanted to recreate something from my childhood because he knew I liked riding the back of his pickup truck. My grandfather, he looked different. He looked young and handsome and he glowed almost like the angels with this light. There was no death in him. I had seen him die. I was the last person he saw and he had leukemia and was in his 70s and did not look the way he looked there. He was the only person who had a connection to me who had passed. And so we spent time together. And then at some point he said, do you want to continue on? And even though I was in the back of this pickup truck driving very slowly through this beautiful green grass, I looked up and I knew what he meant, that there was more to this experience and that God was on the other side of this. So I just shot out of the pickup truck and I was this soul just flying towards God. I just felt great. I felt like every bit of insecurity floated away. I just felt so loved. I felt like this is the greatest place I've ever experienced. Why does anyone ever leave it? <laughs> I want to get closer to this God source, this vibration, this unconditional love. I just felt safe and held in love. Then at some point, there was this energy wall that kind of stopped me and I couldn't go any farther. And it vibrated through me and said, look down. And I looked down and there was this river and there were many people who were walking on it. Some were covered in shadows, some had light. And I saw that if they had light, they were connected to God. From that place, it just looked like fear or love, that there was only a choice between fear or love. And I thought, oh, that's simple. I just go back and tell some people not to fear things, you know, and, and to love more. And, and I was like, okay, I can do that. But God was like, no, you're going to be a teacher and you're going to do that. And I was like, well, I can't do that <laughs> because that's not what I want to do. I want to make money. I grew up extremely poor. And so 
I had planned to go to law school at, at UT and UT has a great law school and I had friends who were in the law school and I thought I'd travel, see Europe, you know, do some fun things. And then eventually I'd already taken the LSAT and I'd, you know, prepared for, for law school. And I thought, just given my skill set with writing, I was like, okay, I can do this. I can be a lawyer. And the idea of teaching or nursing, those were like traditional careers for women. And I considered myself somewhat of a feminist. So I was like, I don't want to do something traditional and low paying. No, thank you. This is not for me. And so God was like, no, you're really going to be a teacher. And that was it. That's the last thing I heard in the presence of God. I, I joke that, you know, I wanted to argue more and there were thoughts that I was having, but it was as if God made me into this ball of energy and I was thrown back through darkness towards my body and ended up in the uh, room where they give you ice chips and ask you to tell your name. And I still was holding on to that experience. My first thoughts, even coming out of anesthesia, where I just had one of those things they call near-death experiences because I'd read about it. And I was like, okay, I had one of those. And then my energy didn't feel fully in my body. I felt like I was a part of the room and the nurse was asking me what my name was. And I literally didn't feel like me yet. I said, well, her name is Trisha. And she said, no, 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 your name. And I was like, Oh, my name. And then I felt a little sad, actually, to come back to the specificness of being me, because I don't know how to describe it, but you're one with everything, but you're also an individual in that space. And so to come back to the body, the body holds trauma, the body holds memory, the body will die here. But in that space, you're eternal and you're free and it's so beautiful. And so there was already a a dislike of being in the body. I felt like I'd been in this beautiful, light-filled, expansive place, and it felt very limiting to come into the body. It felt uh, as if I was being forced back into the body, that it wasn't a choice because if I had my way, I would have stayed there. <laughs> and so this was definitely not my choice. I was sent back and told I had a particular mission. And I'm happy for the mission now, but in that moment, I was not happy. I was in ICU and hooked up to machines for three days. As soon as I could move my arms and talk, my grandmother brought me a journal and I wrote down everything that I remembered about the angels because I was afraid I was getting morphine in the ER and I was afraid this medicine might make the NDE go away and I was like I have to remember this and so I jotted down descriptions of the angels about how they were not like paintings I'd seen that they were light beings and they were so much larger and so much more intense and and tried to hang on to as much as I could I was asking nurses, I'd grab their arms, do you believe in God? And they're like, yes, yes, I believe in God. I go to church. I'm like, God is this big ball of light. And then they were like, okay, <laughs> you know, we've heard enough from you today. <laughs> yeah, so I know people were having these reactions that were like, mm, all right, <laughs> you can stop talking now. And even my surgeon, I did ask her, I said, how long did I die? And she said, you died for about two and a half minutes, and this is really early on, but you're, you got several blood transfusions, you're gonna be okay. And I wanted to ask her more about what I saw and I could just see and I could read energy. And that was not something I'd seen before. I, I couldn't necessarily read people's body language and imagery, but I saw her step back and I saw her have this thought, do not keep talking about this. I do not wanna to have to deal with this. So I knew that she thought I was crazy if I kept talking about it. So I was like, darn, I don't get to ask her. And that disappointed me because I very much wanted to ask her if she knew that she was assisted by angels. but I was different from the beginning. I started seeing people differently and I started seeing manipulation and insecurity and all kinds of things in my family around me. And I wanted to help them, honestly. Like there was, there were these moments I reached out to my mom and tried to tell her about my experience. And the only person in my family who was receptive was my grandmother. And she said to my mom at one point, let her talk, it's okay, this is interesting. This is her experience, she was tolerant. And 
my mother ro rolled her eyes and said, her, how could she possibly know anything about God? And I remember, oh, this is gonna be harder <laughs> to, to break through to her than I, I realized. And I kept trying, you know, and there was a moment where we were finally alone and I was like, mom, I died. And her first question was, did you see Jesus? And I said, well, no. And I could see her tense up that that wasn't a good answer. And I said, but what I experienced was amazing. It's changed me. I do believe in God now. So this is a positive. Can we start there? You know, like I know that we go on. And I wanted to communicate to her that she was just as loved as I am. I said, look, you're wrong and I'm wrong, but we're both loved. Isn't that great? And I could see in her face that she was going, I'm not wrong, <laughs> you're wrong. And so I was like, oh, this isn't meant to be a fight. This is meant to be good news that we're so much lo more loved than we can imagine. So slowly I started shutting down and realizing I couldn't just tell everyone this experience. A lot of indie ears have to be thrown right back into life. And I was lucky in that I had a long recovery, nine months. So I was in a body cast and I, I stayed at my mom and stepdad's house and they would get me books from the library. So I was reading Carlos Castaneda, Marian Williamson, Deepak Chopra, you know, I was just delving into spiritual material. And I was very much in touch with the physical process of healing. It was amazing how nine days in a hospital bed, I mean, I was in the best shape of my life, you know, running nine miles a day, about to run this race. I couldn't even stand on my toes after that, you know, that the body was just so weak that every part of me felt like I was on fire. You know, my whole spine felt like there was a poker that was just in it. And yet it got easier, you know, week by week, and there was improvement. Eventually I could walk and it was the heat of summer. So I had to do this really early in the morning or really late at night. And early morning, there were lots of elderly people out who saw this odd girl with a, a body cast on. And they started asking me about my experience and I got to know the neighbors and they were open. So I found that people who were dying or had a cancer scare, that they loved my story and they were my biggest fans on the street. And when I finally walked to the end of the street, they drank their coffee and clapped for me. And they're like, you did it. And it was like, I had this cheerleader group of, of uh, older folks in my uh, parents' neighborhood. So life was magical, even though it was painful. And there were lots of discoveries. I learned how to lucid dream and I participated with consciousness outside of my body. I, I was really in a beautiful state of kind of quicker integration because I had those nine months to read and meditate and think. I was somewhat closed off before my near-death experience. The only way I opened up is if I had a few drinks or you know, I was hanging out with friends, listening to music. I didn't, I didn't really offer a lot of myself. I wasn't this boundaryless, full of love person. I was, in some ways I kept myself a lot safer because I distrusted people. I had a lot of barriers, you know, I guess because of my childhood, I kept strong boundaries with people. But after my near-death experience, I loved everyone. Like I walked down the street, I was concerned about everyone. I just saw the light in every single human being. I was overflowing with love. I had this telepathy where I understood what people were thinking and feeling. I loved animals. I mean, I, I was so happy that first year. I can't even describe it. Like the, the happiness and the freedom of being able to walk, of being able to explore this world and knowing that there is energy that comes from trees, that there's everything is conscious, that everything is beautiful. That just wasn't in my awareness. The only thing that was in my awareness before was me, you know, just my thoughts, my head. And a lot of those thoughts weren't very good thoughts. And so that was another thing that I realized all those negative thoughts that I had brought me down and I didn't necessarily have to think them. And that became a lifelong process of working with my own thinking and realizing what thoughts are my own, what thoughts are not, and how to live a happier life. 
I also went right back to school and got my teaching certification. So I went ahead and graduated and went and taught immediately. And the minute I was in the classroom, it was magical. Like I thought, what do I do? You know, what am I gonna tell these students? So I just told them the truth. I was like, I don't wanna be a teacher. I know you don't wanna be here. I don't either. <laughs> I was like, but I was told to come here and here's my story. And they were, you know, like mouths open, <laughs> eyes wide. And they were like, I have a question, <laughs> you know, and, and there was just a lot of communication and a lot of connection from the beginning. I find that people love these stories. It makes them think about what comes next or the magical elements of life, or it puts them in touch with their own soul journey. I watched how different students wanted to become psychologists or wanted to, they told me their goals because they trusted me on some level. And I was the you know, they were my first students and that was, this was the first class. And there was so much magic, so much hilarity, so much silliness. It was truly fun, but also life-changing. You know, it's so easy on the other side. There's just love and there's just fear. But over here, sometimes people attack you because of fear. Sometimes people are manipulative because of fear uh, that they don't have enough or they need something from you. And it is devastating, you know, to people. But that fear, I see really as just a block to the light of God. So that can be depression, that can be anything that blocks you from God. And I think nature is a way for many people to heal. I think that's a way that many people could overcome a lot of things is isolation, time in nature, thinking about your life, rethinking what you want to do, how you want to do it differently, and reconnecting with some sort of light. Any moment your soul wakes up on this journey and goes, I'm doing something good, you know, I, I have a dream, I have a gift, or I have something to share or something to help people with. Anytime you wake up and you're connected to something greater than yourself, then you're winning. And I think, I think we can all win, you know, at different times in our lives. And maybe there's struggles. But we can still get to a point where we're giving to society, or we're really enjoying life, where we have a lot of joy in our life, and we know that to the best of our ability, we're giving love to the world. I mean, I know we all get frustrated <laughs> in traffic and technology and all kind of things. I'm, I'm not immune to it. You know, I certainly have moments in life where I'm terribly frustrated, but shifting back into, okay, how do I enjoy this more? How do I remember that my energy affects other people and how do I not affect them in negative ways. And I hope that on a quantum level and on this oneness level, that more and more people are waking up to our connectedness because if we realize that we're all connected and that we're all one, we wouldn't want anyone to suffer, that we would really make suffering in society the main focus. How do we ease suffering? How do we ease suffering in children's life and the elderly and people without insurance and people you know, who can't find a job, people who are disabled? How do we just across the board help people live better lives? I think a lot of near-death experiences are pointing towards, hey, there's a, a greater love on the other side that can help us live better lives. Let's do it.